Okay, the plot. I loved this book. This was so cool. I love how it, you basically wrote two books essentially and like <laughs> stuffed them both in here um, and interwove it so beautifully. Would you mind just explaining to everybody what this book is about and what inspired you to write it? Sure. Um, well, I just before I did that, I want to say that it was while I was on one of your book groups uh, with Lily King last spring, she, she was talking about what it was like to write a book within a book because in her novel, Writers and Lovers, which we were discussing, uh, she was saying that um, no book could ever be as great as the one that her author was writing and therefore she did not write a word of it. And I thought, great, I don't have to write mine either because if Lily King can get away with that, I can too. Unfortunately, my editor said, no, you gotta write it. So, <laughs> so uh, the, the plot does involve a book within a book, which is a very scary uh, uh, prospect because, well, for exactly that reason, you're writing the book that everybody's making a big fuss about and how good does it really, how good is it really? I mean, you think, you know, what book could really fill a stadium of people? And then you go, Gone Girl. Yeah, everybody would have gone to see um, Gillian Flynn uh, at the height of that book. And she would have filled very big uh, rooms. Anyway, what the plot is about is about a failed writer and uh, failure for a writer is always extremely close to us. Wherever we are in our careers, we are, uh, that failure is right behind us, um, whether in our imagination or in reality. So it's about a failed writer named Jake who is really um, watching his career um, descend and descend and descend. He can't write anymore. His last book tanked. He has nothing in the tank. And he is reduced to teaching in a pretty bad MFA program. It's really, they just take anybody who signs up. And he has this horrendous student, the kind of student uh, most teachers have had at some point in their career, who's just a real jerk. And he waltzes into um, class and basically says, well, I don't need you. I don't need to be here because this book that I'm writing is foolproof. It has a plot which is foolproof. And Jake, uh, understandably, thinks to himself, you know, what a jerk, and also how good can it be? But then he hears the plot and he knows that this asshole is absolutely going to have a massive success with this book. He doesn't deserve it. He's not a terrific writer, but he's right. This plot is full. And uh, that's where we leave them for a couple of years. And when Jake, um, sort of wonders to himself a few years later why this book has never come out because obviously he would have heard about it. He discovers that his former student has died and he has died uh, not long after their encounter and there is no book. So he has a brief, you know, uh, wrestle with the angels. Obviously you do not uh, take somebody's idea. You certainly do not take their written language. There are very good reasons for that. Um, but this is a story, and it's a story that was unwritten, uh, obviously not published. And stories, you know, cycle through our history, and they, you know, they appear again and again. Can you own a story? Who gets to tell a story? I mean, a lot of the questions that we writers obsess about. I'm not sure other people obsess about them as much as we do, but we do obsess about them. And, but basically um, he is on a fire with the story. He feels responsibility to this story. And so he writes his own book, not the book his student was writing. And as his former student predicted, he becomes massively successful, but he can't really enjoy it because he's too terrified that somebody is gonna come along who knows what he did. Um, and then somebody does. And the rest of the book is a, a kind of a puzzle to figure out who this person is, what they know. And, uh, you know, Jake also has to ask himself some questions he ought to have asked himself earlier on, like, who was his student and where did he get this idea? And did he perhaps take it from somebody he shouldn't have taken it? So it all comes, you know, round into this, um, I hope suspenseful plot. We do, uh, we do get bits of the novel in question. Um, because, you know, throughout the book, uh, I'm sure everybody who reads it is going to be asking themselves, you know, what is this idea that's so fabulous that, you know, it could really guarantee success. And uh, I don't want to give anything away about that, but um, I think it's surprising the people who have read it. So that's very gratifying. Wow. Um, well, 
it was really fantastic and I hate to use the word propulsive because like everyone's using that word these days, but it really did like, you know, pull you through as if there's like some sort of lasso on your waist and you're just like holding on. I was like water skiing behind this <laughs> to try to catch up to see what was going to happen next. And, um, you know, I had so much compassion, actually. I mean, I felt badly that Jake had taken the story, but I, the, 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 anxiety he lived with and the self um almost immolation and yeah. it, it, it like broke my heart too so I don't know I, I couldn't tell if I was rooting for him or not I kind of want I'd like all along I won't give anything away but like I just wanted him to like decide he was gonna like come clean and you know shout it from the rooftops or something you know I don't know yeah. but anyway that's well, he what does reach a point where he actually does that there's a there's a, a scene towards the end in which he's suddenly channeling Ozymandias from the Shelley poem, who uh, is this, you know, if your listeners remember Ozymandias, it's about this lost uh, uh, tyrant whose ruin, ruins, the ruins of his city and his statue are, are in some desert in the middle of nowhere. And he says, look upon my works, ye mighty in despair. And Jake does have a moment of that arrogance where he's like, screw it. Um, I did nothing wrong. I'm going to tell everybody. But does that come to happen? I cannot say. <laughs> I think like a lot of the protagonists I've written over the years, Jake is not a particularly likable guy. I'm not, I'm not a big fan of the likable, of the automatically likable protagonists. I don't I don't look for likable people in fiction. I look for them in my real life. I was going to ask <laughs> if you did or not. <laughs> I don't need um, everybody in a book to be my best friend. Um, and, and Jake is complicated. I mean, he has been so, uh, so twisted by his perceived failure and the loss of what he thinks he deserved to have and what he worked very hard to have. Um, Writers' minds, as I'm sure you know, are very complicated places. You know, we're 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 courageous people. We do this insane thing where we write a story nobody's asking us to write, um, which is a, an act of great arrogance, but also incredible humility. Because when it fails, as it often does, you know, we have to acknowledge that it's failed, and we have to put it away, and we have to start over. And these are not easy things to do. But I feel like you've had so many successes yourself. Have you had failures that maybe oh I don't God. know about? I feel yeah. you have like all these like best selling, I mean, movies and books. And I mean, your resume is like even just like looking at your, I mean, look at this. You would just think, you know, you should have known, which was on HBO as The Undoing and Admission, which was a film with Tina Fey and The Devil and Webster and The White Rose and The Sabbath. Day River and a jury of her peers and interference powder and more and more and more. I mean, you don't seem like someone who we should be like, oh, well, Jean must have had lots of failure. <laughs> well, it, this is probably not the moment in my career to um, to rehearse all, you know, to, to regurgitate all of my failures. There have been many. Um, you have to understand that, you know, the plot is my seventh novel. And until maybe six months ago, it was absolutely ordinary to walk into a bookstore and find none of my books there. Um, I was a completely unknown entity, except perhaps among some writers. Uh, my name would have drawn absolutely no recognition <laughs> among most readers. And, um, you know, I, I'm, I'm not going to say that was no problem, no worries, no big deal. It, it hurt a lot. But, you know, my job was always to write the best book that I could. And I was very fortunate in that I had uh, one uh, editor in, in particular who really believed in me, even though I continued to uh, not, not put, you know, the, the money on the plate as far as book sales. So I'm grateful to my agent. I'm grateful to my editor. And I'm grateful to the writer friends who stood by me, but no, I was not a successful writer at all. I get, I mean, if, depending on how you're measuring success. Exactly, exactly. In terms of you walk into Barnes and Noble and they have your books, I was not successful. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. In terms of, uh, you know, you, you meet somebody at a, a party where they're 
lots of writers whose work you've read and loved and you introduce yourself and they just have no idea who you are. You know, but, but these, again, these are the things that you have to remember, they're out of your control. Oh, what's in your control is how good the book is. And also, you know, starting over and doing it again. And, you know, that's enough, that's hard enough without taking on the New York Times bestseller list or you know, whatever other measures out there. You just have to keep going. And you mentioned until six months ago. So what's happened since The Undoing came out? How has your life changed at all? Like, I, I, I sense a disturbance in the force. You know? <laughs> I feel, I know obviously I'm, I'm in a rural place in upstate New York. I've been here for most of the last year. I'm not going to conferences or frequenting bookstores any more than anybody else is. But I, I sense that, uh, that my work is being um, uh, recognized or anticipated or people are engaging with it. I, I'm seeing a lot of things like, well, I read, I read You Should Have Known, which became The Undoing. And I see she has you know six other books, so I'm going to read them now. This is a wonderful thing to me. And it's a great thing about, um, books in general, that they don't go anywhere. I mean, they may not be on the shelf in Barnes and Noble, but you know, this is one thing we can thank the internet for. I'm constantly writing down the names of books that I'm hearing about for the first time, even though they came out decades ago or sometimes centuries ago, and I can get them and I can, I read them. I do it all the time. In fact, I have a, this, an extra special little Instagram account called Books of Yesteryear, which are just old books that I'm reading. Huh. I mean, they, I buy them in flea markets. I, I get them on the internet. Um, this is in addition to all the contemporary stuff that, that I'm constantly reading. So, I mean, it's a great thing about, about books. They're mostly forever. I didn't even realize, and I've been a lifelong, like huge reader, like recreationally, right? Just love to read. I didn't realize how much um, focus inside the literary industry was on new releases like because that's never how I used to shop I mean I would go to that table or look at that wall but I would look at so much more than that was just like one stop that's one wall in the whole bookstore I so I, when so I even funny. when I started even like pitching people to come on the show I remember asking like Michael Lewis or somebody like I was like oh I'll just start with like you know Michael Lewis who <laughs> course said no but anyway and his agent said something like um you know and he doesn't have a book coming out and I was like okay like why is that even a thing you know right. and then I realized like it's all the industry is makes it feel like it's so much about new releases but literature is literature and you it know, is it is so like backlist phenomenon I'm like what's a backlist it's like <laughs> oh the other books people have written is now backlist sounds so derogatory like yeah. it should be like their I don't know magnum opus or I don't know something with a better name well, the book that I always want to hear about is the book that you read, you know, uh, 20 years ago, that you have one old torn up copy that is out of print that nobody's ever heard of. I want to know what that book is, and I want to order it immediately from Thrift Books or Better World Books, um, and, and I want to read it. I mean, these are the books that get, get me going, you know, in addition to all the new stuff as well. It's just, it's impossible. The list of, the list of, great books that I have not read is so embarrassing. And I read constantly. I, I read at least three books a week, usually more. So uh, it's, we all have our list of shame of the books that, <laughs> but I did finally get through Ulysses. So at least that's off my list of shame. I'm not even trying to go back to classics that I've missed. So, you know, you're a thousand steps ahead of me. I'm like, I missed those ones. They weren't assigned in school. <laughs> can't, can't worry about it now. Like, <laughs> um, so well, when you still there when you're ready for them. Yeah. If I want to go back, which eventually, um, if you, so when you're reading all these books, three books a week, is it mostly fiction, poetry, memoir, like what type of genre? I read a lot of memoirs and I read, uh, a lot of fiction and I read a lot of old fiction. Um, I do like the odd biography, the odder, the better and, and nonfiction too, if it's something that I'm interested in. So um, I, I have about, I don't know, 80 books stacked up upstairs that I, I mean, it's impossible, but it's wonderful too. And I, I think because I was always a reader, I think the fact that I never 
suffered from you know severe depression or anything like that can be directly traced to the fact that I was a reader. There was always a book that I was looking forward to reading, and I I mean there, there's nothing that I can imagine that I can pinpoint in my you know history or chemistry or whatever that would have spared me that. It's only the fact that I always had something to read. So you know get your kids reading because. I think it's a great stay against some of the vicissitudes. I totally, oh. I totally agree. This whole bibliotherapy thing <laughs> is like long overdue, right? It's yeah. uh, something people um, have known for a long time without perhaps a name. Um, but yes, um, plus the fact that you're just not ever alone, right? You're always in someone else's mind and always thinking and learning and um, accompanied no matter Absolutely. what. Absolutely. You're, you're not alone. You're transported. And you know what? If it's not working for you, there's an infinity of other worlds and other minds you can be entering. So yeah, books have, books have ordered my life and enriched my life. And to me, like the highest thing that I could ever aim to do was write a novel. And I remember when I was a kid, my, my father asking me if I thought I had a novel in me. And, and I lied. I lied to him. I said, yes, but I didn't think I could do it. <laughs> it maybe it was just an early uh, example of fake it till you make it. But I, I wanted it so desperately. And when I started to do it, and I, you know, I failed quite decisively, um, you know, picking yourself up and saying, now I'm going to do it again is uh, and try harder and do better. Um, that's, that's really something I'm proud of. So when you started writing your own fiction, did you just sit down and try it? Or did you like try to learn the craft or like, how did you approach it? No, I was a, a poet uh, at the beginning. I started writing poetry in high school and all through college. And I went to Cambridge for two years after college. Uh, and I was only writing poetry, but I was only reading fiction because, I mean, my natural inclination really went towards the novel. And one of the things I realized at one point was that I was, you know, that, that the dream was fiction and I, I had to stop putzing around with poetry. Um, but I think writing poetry was a, a fantastic way to begin because poetry teaches you respect for language and in a way that maybe even fiction doesn't. And every word in every book that I write is weighed and compared to 10 other, you know, uh, alternatives, even in a so-called thriller. The, the, I can't leave a sentence if I don't think it's beautiful, maybe too big a word, but if I don't think it's as fine as it can be, I just can't leave it there. I, it, it bothers me. So um, I'm glad that I started with poetry and, and uh, I stopped completely after my only book of poems was published. So that was another indication that I was really not going to be a poet. Although some of my best friends are poets and I'm married to a poet. So I'm still <laughs> in the poetry world. Um, but yeah, I, I took the road equally traveled. <laughs> Wow. Um, and so if you have that approach to writing where every sentence bothers you, which by the way, I love just hearing that because um, I'm sure so many people can relate to that sort of perfectionism and something that can't be perfected, right? It's a sentence, like you have to at some point let it go. Um, how long does something like this, like how, how long did this book take and how long have some of your other books taken to write? This this novel was a once in a lifetime experience fueled by, I think you will agree, some rather unusual circumstances. Um, the, the, the story is that around the time that you and I met a little over a year ago, um, I, I had this extraordinary uh, meeting with my editor in her office. And the purpose of this meeting was for her to explain to me why she was not buying the book that I've been working on yet. Um, it was a big novel. It was quite a different book than this. It was about a New York family with triplets and a big family saga. Um, and it, it just wasn't working. And, and she called me into her office. And this was the second in a series of meetings, um, basically telling me the exact same thing, which was that she was not going to buy it yet. Um, but I was so upset because I had been working on it for so long. And by the way, that's my dog barking because- That's okay. I, I figured, I figured. Um, 
And in the middle of this meeting, which was, you know, not a great meeting, I heard myself say to her, well, you know, I have this other idea. And then I just upchucked this idea that had really just come to me. And I knew, I knew that this idea was good. I mean, good. The last time I'd had an experience like this, it was, you should have known. And that, you know, that became the undoing. It just came to me. And you know, I've had books that I thought about for literally 20 years before I wrote the first sentence, but this was just there. And I started to tell my editor um, the story, the plot of the plot, which was already called the plot, even though it was just being born on the spot. And I could see her get more and more excited, which was very gratifying. And the next day she bought both books. So, oh my gosh. I mean, it was, it was an amazing experience professionally. But it also meant that I had a new project just as everything was shutting down. And I, as I think I've mentioned before, I was very, very upset and very scared and very angry about what was happening. And suddenly I was up in this very snowbound house in upstate New York and I had this book to write. So it was a kind of perfect storm of propulsion to use your word. Um, and I wrote this novel in three and a half months, which is insane. And I hope never to have an experience like that again, because, you know, it took a lot out of me. But it was three and a half months of writing every day, all day. And at the end of it, I had, you know, this novel that I was very, very happy with and am very happy with. There were not many changes that were made. I mean, there was a lot of revising of sentences, but basically the story, the characters, it was all there. And so, um, I mean, usually a novel takes two, two and a half years for me to write. This took three and a half months, but I hope people will not hear that and think, oh, it's, <laughs> it was just dashed off. It was, um, it was a very intense writing experience. That's still close to like a hundred days of just sitting there writing all day. I mean, a hundred days in a row of what doing else anything. What did I have to do? Yeah. I'm, I, but not everybody wrote. A, yeah. I mean, you could have done a million things. You could have baked banana bread like everybody else. You know, I did so. not bake any banana bread. I figured you couldn't. How could you? <laughs> I did not bake any banana bread. No. Um, what advice would you have to aspiring authors, other than perhaps not stealing somebody else's <laughs> story? <laughs> well. I I mean, the, the best advice to anybody who wants to write is to read. I mean, the, I know this is where people insert, write, you must write. Yeah, of course you must write. You must, um, if you don't write, you, 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 you can't be a writer, but people seem not to recognize the crucial um, element of reading. And, you know, it helps if you're an obsessive reader from a young age. Thankfully, most of us who want to write are, but there are a lot of people out there who don't feel it's necessary to read other people's books. They, um, they have some idea that, you know, their voice is just waiting to, to say wonderful things and in a scintillating way, and everybody will stop what they're doing and, and want to read their book. I, I'm not saying that never happens, but um, for most of us, you must read, you must want to read, you should want to read. Um, never fear that, you know, um, that it's dangerous to read because you'll incorporate other people's voices. This is a, this happens, it happens to all of us. And it's an important phase that we all go through. And my, my husband went through a T.S. Eliot phase where he was writing like T.S. Eliot, he was very young. Um, but it, it's, a um, it's, it's something that is an important part of finding our own way of speaking. Um, but, you know, if you don't love language, you shouldn't be a writer. I mean, just do something else. Be a ballroom dancer. I'd love to be a ballroom dancer. I can't do that. You know, it just literature should be left to those of us who love literature. <laughs> it just seems like, seems like an awful thing to say, but it's also like a no brainer, I think. That's a good point. I mean, you have to love what you do. You right. Do. I mean, um, otherwise, I don't know. I do. Why do it? Why do, do it? Else. Yeah. Like else. you said, nobody's assigning you these stories necessarily. Right? <laughs> Nobody was saying, Gene, where? <laughs> Actually, my my mom and dad, 94 and 88, were waiting for every chapter as I was Aww. writing it. And I was very happy to be uh, sending them along. Uh, 
because it was distracting all of us last last winter. And so what happened with the other book? Is that going to come out next? Yeah, I am. Uh, I'm, I have a deadline of July and I, I think I know what I need to do to make it work. It is a very different book from the plot. I mean, I've, in my career, I've always kind of ricocheted back and forth across this genre line. I don't have control over the books that I, you know, am given to write. Um, it has been... I think it's been part of the reason why I, I have not been better known, that every time I get traction with uh, one book, the next book will disappoint people because it's so different, but I, I can't help it. I mean, um, you could hold up, you know, you should have known uh, next to the book that was written uh, before it, Admission, which is a literary novel, but sort of became a comedy movie with the, with Tina Fey, the adorable movie. It was a really sweet movie. Um, and then the book before that, which, which was called The White Rose and it's about New York in the 1990s. And it's the plot of Strauss's Der Rosen Cavalier among wealthy Jewish New Yorkers. And think these can't be by the same person. Um, and that's a flaw in the publishing world. You know, bookstores and readers really want a kind of branding and I've just not been able to do that. But um, I hope that people will enjoy the plot and the next novel, which is called The Latecomer um, in different ways. And I hope they'll give The Latecomer a chance if they- Well, I feel like Jake um, might weigh in on this and say, you know, you're only as good as your last book, right? Everybody keeps saying that um, and you know, that's his like mantra, I feel like. So I don't think readers, care as long as they like the books yeah i hope so i mean i really think i mean i don't know i it'll be a great book and people will read it and Thank just you. go That's from there nice just go from it's uh marketing of marketing is a separate animal you know it is i was just uh having a phone call this morning with the head of digital marketing um uh, from Celadon this morning. And I, I mean, this is another first in my career that I just feel so supported by my publisher and they've been really, really fantastic. So um, you, your, your readers, your followers may or may not be aware that in every, for every publisher in every season, there are two or three books that they're gonna hear about. And then <laughs> there's another 50, 60, 70 books out there and, um, to get that magic fairy dust from your publisher is just, a, it's a wonderful thing. But there are a lot of books um, right behind them that are also terrific and, and want us to read them. So. Very true. Well, Jean, thank you. Thank you for the plot. Thank you for writing the book, by the way, that became The Undoing, which I inhaled in a single <laughs> day with my husband once. Um, and, you know, I you've, you give off a very self, um, I think you should feel really awesome about your career more so than I, you do. I actually do. I, maybe I'm, I, I'm proud of myself for keeping going yes. and I'm proud of myself for writing books that pleased me. Um, so yeah, there's a lot to be proud of, yeah. but it, um, it, it's been a long time since okay. that, that first book was written and, um, and I'm here, you know, just like at the end of the, the color purple, I'm here and I'm fine. So it's all good. It's all good. All right. Well, thank you. Um, that's actually super inspiring. So um, thank you. Thanks for sharing thank everything. You. And I hope to see you back at an event once they start in person. Again. Yeah. Are we I'm... allowed to keep talking or should we? Yep. Okay. Let me just press stop. <laughs>